face All is stripped away And I simply come Longing just to bring Something that's of worth That will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking King of endless words, no one could express how much you deserve. Welcome, and we are so glad that you can join us for worship this morning. Let's get out of the cold, get out of the wet weather, and into the warmth of being in God's presence. This past Wednesday was Veterans Day, and we want to offer a belated thanks to those who have served our country in the armed services. Thank you for the service sacrifices and the risks you made in defending and preserving our freedom. We have three announcements to make this morning. The first is that this afternoon at 3 o'clock, we'll be having our general congregational meeting, GCM. Again, it's at 3 o'clock, and the website, uh, the link to the Zoom meeting, you can see that, uh, again, at our church's website. At this meeting, we'll be giving you an update of the 2020 budget, and also vote on the 2021 budget, and also vote on the 2021 church council members. So we look forward to you joining with us that, uh, this afternoon. Next Sunday... November 22nd, we'll be having our first virtual Thanksgiving service. Again, next Sunday at 7 p.m., we'll be having our first virtual Thanksgiving service at 7 p.m. I promise this is a program that you do not want to miss. We'll be having special music and special guests, but we also want to involve you. You can participate, and we want you to send in a a picture or a short video to say what you are thankful for uh, to the Lord. So if you want to turn those things in, you can send it to uh, this address, cibcphotos at gmail.com. Again, cibcphotos at gmail.com. And the things have to be in by, well, it was supposed to be on the 13th, but we're going to move it to, to tomorrow, right? I'll give you a couple more uh, hours to think about it and then turn it in by tomorrow and then we can include that all in f to make this uh, next Sunday's Thanksgiving uh, program so much more special. The third announcement is that the collection for this year's Samaritan's Purse ends tomorrow. Well, everything ends tomorrow. Uh, next Sunday, I should say, on the 23rd. So again, it ends next Monday at November 23rd. So there's still time if you want to participate. Some of you would want to go online. Maybe you want to, instead of actually going out to, sh to shop, you would just said that I'll send in the money. And I think for $25, you can send in, uh, turn in your money and they will purchase something for you or you indicate what you want. But all things need to be turned in by the 23rd. We are not taking a collection at the church like we used to. We would all line up and, and take it out. No, uh, what they're going to do instead is that you send it directly to the collection places. So the best place to look, uh, again, you can come back to our church's website, and I'll show you uh, the shoebox uh, where to send it in, and it's the green button. So 
for all, if you can't find it, just look for the green button and that will direct you to where the collection places are. And from what I understand, we already have 250 boxes uh, set up. So that's, we're a quarter of the way through from what we accomplished last year. Well, you did not come to church or come to worship this morning to hear a bunch of announcements. Instead, you came to worship. And so let's prepare our hearts to, for worship with prayer. Give ear to our words, O Lord. Consider our meditations. Hearken unto the voice of our cry, our King and our God. We come to worship you this morning. Direct our focus on you and you alone. For there is no other Savior than Jesus Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So let's turn our time over to Eric as he leads us in a time of worship through song and praise. Good morning, CIBC. We welcome you to this morning's worship service. As we begin our service, I can think of no more appropriate way to begin our service this morning than by the words of the Apostle Paul. As he begins his many of his letters, he writes, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God our Father and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's only when we come into contact with God and know him Uh, that we begin to understand the depths of his grace and experience new measures of his peace in our lives. We've gone through a lot over this last year. And as, as after going through so much, it can sometimes be hard to live confidently in our faith. Can't it? But when life takes a turn and we have no explicit assurances of what our tomorrow will bring, it's then that God fills us with his inexplicable peace and keeps us there as we wait upon him. And when we don't know what tomorrow will bring, we still know who holds our tomorrows in his hands. And we know that he has always been faithful and will continually be faithful in our lives. And it's as we go through these trials, like this last year, everything that we've been going through, where it just feels like we're in a free fall, like we're grasping for any glimmer of hope. It's then, it's then that God is carrying us. We realize how he's been carrying us in his everlasting arms. So this morning, may God fill you with a confident hope in himself. And may he flood your spirit with his grace and his peace as we come before him and worship him this morning together. Let's sing together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms.
salvation for all times. My shelter, my defense. You're my song in the night. Though storms may rise, I lift my darkness lead me in your ways hide me in your shadow flood me with your grace rescue me from darkness lead me in your ways hide me in your shadow flood me with your grace rescue me Thanks again, Eric, for leading us through a time of praise and song. Let's continue our worship as we approach God's word. Let's start with the word of prayer. Again, Father, we thank you for the time that we can gather to look into your word. Again, we ask that you open our eyes that we may see many wonderful truths from your word. Open our minds, change the way we think. Open our hearts, Lord, that we would desire to change. But most importantly, Lord, we ask that you would open our hands, that we place it in yours, that wherever you lead us, wherever you guide us, we will follow you all the days of our lives as an act of worship and as a witness to you, to, of, of you. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Lamps or lights have always been associated with guiding people to safety, and especially now that uh, we have the time of change, it gets dark a lot earlier. Uh, on camping trips, we're always told to bring a flashlight to shine the path that is ahead of us because we don't have those street lights. Uh, at night, we uh, turn on the lights uh, 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 to show our way, especially for our cars as we drive on the road. For centuries, ship pilots have relied on the beam of light from lighthouses to help them uh, guide them and navigate the, 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 the hazardous coastlines to lead them to a safe harbor. 
For the month of November, we've been looking at different passages or different psalms that describe God. Uh, for instance, in, 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 in uh, November 1st, we looked at Psalms 107 that talked about God is our Redeemer. Last week, we looked at Psalms 5, God is our King. And this morning, we will look at Psalms 27, God is our light and our salvation. And in Psalms 27, David declares the Lord is his light or is his light and salvation. But what does that mean? What does it mean that God is our light and our salvation? Well, light and salvation are fairly common words in the Bible. But what do they mean together and in the Old Testament? Because we have some preconceived ideas of what uh, that God is our light and God is our salvation. Well, first of all, In the Psalms, light refers to God's guidance, his presence, and his direction, like a lamp, like you're holding a lamp. Psalms 18.28 says this, You, O Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. Wonderful idea that God is present there. He's a light, and he shines in the darkness. Uh, Psalms 43, verse 3 says this, Send forth your light and your truth, and let them guide me. Let them bring me to your holy mountain, to the place where you dwell. Again, you get the idea of God guiding us and guiding us into his very presence. How about salvation? In the Old Testament, salvation refers to rescue or deliverance from a present danger. And so what we need to do is take off our thinking caps from the New Testament that when we think of salvation, we automatically run to Jesus Christ. But in the Old Testament, this is a little bit before Jesus came and before he died on the cross. So it has a little different meaning. It has to do with generally the idea of rescue or deliverance. Isaiah 12, 2. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Of course, Isaiah was a prophet, and this is during a time when Israel was about to be conquered by different nations, and so the prophet Isaiah has to comfort the people to warn them to come back to God, but to remind them, God will save you, but not in a Jesus Christ salvific way, but so much as that God will save you, he will rescue you from the dangers that you are facing. Psalm 62 says this, my soul finds rest in God alone, my salvation comes from him. Again, this is probably a psalm of David. He's out in the wilderness, and he says, you know what? It is my soul that finds rest in the Lord, that he is the one who's going to deliver me from these trying times. Well, the combination of the Lord being both light and salvation, it has a different tone, and that when it's used as a combination, it foreshadows Jesus as the Messiah. Isaiah 49. Remember, the book of Isaiah begins about Israel's challenges, and then when it comes to about the halfway point uh, in chapter 39 on, it starts having a more messianic tone. And we'll talk about that more during our Advent series. Uh, In fact, a couple weeks from now, we'll look in the book of Isaiah to talk about how it talks about the, uh, the prophet of hope that the Lord is coming. So this is one of the examples. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. In Isaiah 49, it's actually talking about Jesus Christ, that, and, and that he will come to not only share the gospel for the Jews, but also to the Gentiles. And then uh, you see this as an, again um, in Acts chapter 13, when Paul will cite this passage, uh, when he and Barnabas came to Presidian Antioch, way outside of, of Israel, they were in Presidian Antioch, and he says that we are here to bring light and salvation. And what does that talk about? Is that we are here to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. So here you got the idea that when, when it says the Lord is a light and salvation, on one hand, you have deliverance, and in one way, but also it foreshadows the future about the Messiah coming. But we're going to stick ourselves to the Old Testament for that part. So we're going to talk about the salvation part uh, further down from here. Not today, but probably 
further down the line. But let's look and crawl under um, or crawl into David's uh, skin and to find out what does he mean by that. And so not only, uh, what do you mean, David, but for you, why did you write these words? And then also for us in the 21st century, what does it mean to us? And we'll discover as we look closer at Psalms 27 that when we say that the Lord is being our light and our salvation, this is what we mean. For David, it meant trusting in Lord to be his light and salvation to survive the dark times. Just on surface, when you say, why is God as my light? Is it because I'm facing dark times? Why do I need salvation? Why do I need deliverance? Because I'm facing difficult times. So in the same sense that when we say the Lord is our light and salvation, it means the same thing to us, that we're asking God, we need you because we're facing dark times. We're facing difficult times. And I want to claim this promise that you indeed will guide us through. So, what is the main point of this passage that we'll look into this? Is that the, with the Lord as our light and salvation, we can trust him wherever he leads us. Again, with the Lord as our light and salvation, we can trust him wherever he leads us. That means that wherever the Lord guides us, wherever he is as a shepherd, we will follow him because we trust him implicitly that he will lead me. That where I need to be, where God wants me to be. So let's dive into this passage. When we find, follow the Lord, first of all, we will find that we will find strength. We will find strength in the Lord, verses 1 through 6. So let's look at that. this as, as David affirms his confidence in the Lord's guidance. Verses 1 through 3 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. As you look at this passage in these verses, he just declared his confidence in the Lord. And this confidence is an active confidence to say that, God, that you are in control no matter what is about me. And in case if you didn't hear it, is that as we read this passage, the word fear or afraid appears three times in these three verses. So it's on the forefront of his mind that every sentence he say, says or everything he cries out to the Lord for, he says, I'm afraid there's this fear that is around me. You now, being afraid and being fearful is the opposite of complete trust or confidence. You know, when we fear the wrong things, we fall into sin and face dark consequences. You remember Saul. Saul lost the kingdom because he did not trust God. Instead of waiting for the prophet Samuel to show up to, for the sacrifices, Saul took it upon himself. He says, I was afraid because the men were running. The Philistines are coming. And Lord, I was afraid, so I offered the sacrifices. And for that reason, Saul lost the opportunity to have his kingdom to last forever because he feared the wrong things. David had every reason to be afraid. I mean, you think about it and you, as you look at his life, and those of us who are been studying the, the life of David, we know that he had very many reasons to fear, and he always lived in fear. Uh, and we began by saying that Saul ran away from, I mean, David ran away from Saul. Remember, uh, he had that, that meal and he was supposed to be there for the Passover. And, and, and King da uh, Saul just threw a spear at David. And, and, so, and he was always on the run. He had, was always afraid of being hunted down by his enemies. Second Samuel 22, there's all kinds of enemies that are chasing after him. And so da David would always be uh, uh, marauding. He was always being running around in the desert looking for a place to hide. And then later in his life, uh, he was chased away by his own son Absalom, who wanted to take the throne. 
So David, when he wrote this thing about being afraid, he knew, he experienced it, what it meant to be in fear. But that fear subsided. Those fears subsided once you, we begin to understand God's character as being our light and our salvation to guide us. Fear is an emotion. And what David is saying is that we got to go back to the facts. Who is God? Because if you let our fears to ride, override us, it, they will come, overcome us, they'll consume us. And we do some bad things, we fall into sin. But David does not succumb to those fears. He goes back to the fact side of who the Lord is. So that's why he says, not only is the Lord my light and my salvation, but he expresses his trust by calling the Lord his stronghold. Back Going back to verse 1. That word stronghold is a Hebrew word, ma'at. And it means strength. It also can mean fortress or a helmet. So you got a, a word picture that's going on here is that when he says God is you, basically the word there is that God, you are my strength. But when you say about my strength, it, it has pictures in the mind about a stronghold or, or, or a place that is a fortress. I mean, remember David was running away from Saul and he would go to the wilderness. And the passage would often say that he went to these caves that were his strongholds. It's like you go into a cave to hide as a protection that this becomes a place that protects me or a, 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 um, a fortress that, that protects me from the enemies. Uh, Solomon uses the same word uh, that he had to fortify the cities after he conquered them, that he had to strengthen them. And so what you got going on here, here is that when David says, God, you are my stronghold or you're my strength, he's not picturing another fortress that says God on it. But what really he's talking about is his spiritual and moral strength. Because our battles are not always physical battles, but the, the moral battles, the emotional battles, the battles when people verbally persecute us. The battles that go on with our mind of what you believe God to be true. And, he, and, and, and David says, God, I come back to you. You're my refuge. You're my stronghold. You're my strength. That I find strength when I trust in you and you alone. What David is saying is that spiritually speaking, Lord, I find refuge in you. And he says that in verses 4 through 6 that his ultimate stronghold or his strength is in the presence of the Lord. Look what it says. One thing I ask of you, Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Now, I want to stop here for a little bit because when we say these things, the, the temple had not been built yet. Remember, it would be Solomon who would take years to build it after David dies. So what he has in mind here is the house of the Lord. Actually, the ark came and they had to put a tent, a covering over it. So it was a very temporary thing. Even the word tabernacle, it was a very temporary thing. But probably what's going on in David's mind is not so much the physical presence, but his spiritual presence to be before the Lord. The time he spent just coming before the Lord and maybe his quiet time, maybe his meditation, his singing to the Lord, that he's not thinking of a temple because it hasn't been built yet, nor the tabernacle because he had to bring it from Nob, uh, the, the remnants of the tabernacle down to Jerusalem. So for him, it's in his mind. David always saw that the Lord's presence 
was the best place for him to find shelter for protection. And that's where the English word sanctuary comes from, that we find security, safety, God's protection, metaphorically, in the house of the Lord. I mentioned earlier that Saul was chasing after David. And the first place the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 21, the first place that David could think of to go to was to go to Nob where that the temple or the tabernacle was still there. Remnants of it was still there. David wanted to find refuge. Not so much in the tabernacle or building itself. But what the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, represented, the presence of the Lord. So I need to ask you this. Is coming to the Lord your first instinct when trouble comes? What do you do when difficulty hits you, when the dark times come? And what the psalm is telling us is that Finding sanctuary, coming before the Lord, that ought to be the first thing that comes to your mind. And as you look back at these verses, do you desire, do you desire, next slide please, going back to this verse, do you desire to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life? I mean, do you delight in being with the Lord, just spending time before the Lord? Do you gaze upon the beauty of the Lord? Wow. That's a, what does that mean? Does the Lord look beautiful to you? Do you stare and just coming before the Lord? And, you know, this Thanksgiving season, you know, you, you heard that song, Oh Lord, you are beautiful. But if God was asked to ask you, okay, in what way am I beautiful? Because Isaiah 53 says uh, he, was, he was so uh punished for our sins, that he, he was unrecognized, that nobody wanted to put, you know, look at him because he looked. So what do you mean by the beauty of the Lord? What does the Lord mean to you that it's a beautiful sight? Is he a sight for sore eyes that you can come before him and say, Lord, you're beautiful, what you mean to me? Do you delight in meditating on God's goodness? What about it? What can you write down, Lord, you're beautiful, that you're good to me? And it says here, to seek him in his temple. Obviously, this is a metaphor because the temple had not been built, but he can just imagine in his mind that he's looking to find to how to come into the Lord's presence. Now, you've got to remember from David's perspective, because he, he's from the Old Testament, and he cannot come directly into God's presence. First of all, David was not from the tribe of Levi, nor was he a priest that had, or the high priest who could come before the Lord once a year. And so he was thinking, there's that desire, Lord, to come into your presence like those priests do. Oh, what a privilege that would have. But you know what? We as believers, we have that privilege to come before the Lord because what Christ did for us. And we looked at that last week in the book of Hebrews, how Jesus ushers us right into the very presence of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, take that, that opportunity, that privilege we have to come before the Lord that when we follow the Lord, we will find that we will find strength in the Lord. He enables us. He enables us to do what pleases Him. The second thing, what will we find when we follow the Lord? What we will find? Divine support. We will find divine support. Look what it says in verses 7 through 12. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says to me, seek his face. Your face, O Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God, my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a path, a straight path, because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desires of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, breathing out violence. Now, as you read these verses, 
Again, I want you to see this uh, for, for right now, just to see these verses that trouble doesn't disappear. It's still around him. They're hounding after him. And he's asking God, I need your support. I need you to help me. See, David grew up as a shepherd. He always knew who his shepherd were, was. What? The Lord, right? Psalms 23. And in Psalms 23, we told, we're told how the Lord leads us through the green pastures and through the, and, and, you know, the good times. But it says that, and he even sets a table before my enemies. And that his rod and staff, they comfort me. That we have nothing to fear. So when you read Psalms 23, it doesn't say that our, our difficulties will just disappear. Rather, it says that they will stay there. But God will be there to guide us through those difficult times. Like again, like this, the, 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 the lighthouse that draws a ship. He will guide them through those difficult times to bring them through the safe path. And in this passage, in verse 9, it says, David declares the Lord has always been his helper. His helper. Ezer is the Hebrew word. In some of us, we have heard the word Ebenezer. And Ebenezer just means the, the rock of my help. And so God is our helper. It's the same word that God uses to describe Eve. Eve was the helper to Adam. Now, it's funny that God would be cast in this way as a helper, but it's actually a, a, a person that completes you. It's just like Eve completes Adam. Eve in no may, way is inferior, but it completes Adam because with Adam without Eve can never have a family. All the things that he was to do in the garden, even he needed Eve's help. And the same way, God is saying that I am your helper, just like Adam needed Eve. I, the Lord, your God, I am your strength. But you know what? I'm not just your strength to just give you the strength, but what? I'm going to come and help you. I will support you. I will guide you through this. And so you can lean on me, if you can put it in another way. When, I, when God is my help, I can lean on God because he's going to be there to help me through this. Psalms 46, verses 1 and 2 says this, God is my refuge and strength and ever-present help. Again, eat, sir. In trouble, therefore we will not fear. We will not fear. Again, fear has a way of corroding our confidence and trust in God. And when you look at the life of David, and especially if you look at the life of Abraham, every time that they, when they face a difficult situation, and if there's no mention of ever seeking God, or God is in this picture, without fail, they sin. Conversely, when David or Abraham, when they faced difficult situations and they sought the Lord, they had victory. Is it because of them as an individual? No. It's because they leaned on for the support of the Lord to help them through those situations. You see, if we don't seek the Lord in trying times, our fears will consume us, and they'll cause us to make decisions that we will regret in our lives because we will fall into sin. There's something about support. And I, don't know, I, I just thought about this, uh, uh, that you know, when you have support, it keeps you from going the wrong direction. For instance, if your arm is broken, you put an arm brace that you're not supposed to bend your arm, that support keeps you from doing things that you shouldn't be doing. And in that sense, that's what God says, I will be not only your strength, but I will support you that, to make sure you do the things the right way. And David does that. David says, you know, like last week, God, you're my king, but I can come to you and share all my cares. 
Well, we have a similar thing here is that David shows his active trust by asking God for help in four different areas. God, I need your support. I need you because I can't do it alone. Well, what's the first one? He says in verse 7, hear my voice, be merciful. David confessed his dependence on God and appealed to God's mercy. And all of us should say that. That, Lord, we need your support and we confess our sins. Because if it wasn't for your mercy and forgiving my sins, I would be nowhere. And so, Lord, I cry out to you because not of my great merit, but of, because, but of your great mercy that has come upon me. The second thing that David asks God for support in is that, what, teach me. Verse 11, teach me your ways. Teach me your ways. There is a word in the Bible about learning God's word. Uh, it's a Hebrew word, and it's haga, haga. I know it sounds terrible, but haga, a haga, means to meditate. And that same word, it, it, it is also used of a cow when it eats grass. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, when I was much younger in life, one of the first things I learned about a cow is that it has what? Four stomachs. And what a cow would do, would eat, and then the food would go in one part of the stomach, then it goes to the second part of the stomach, then the third stomach, and then the fourth stomach. I know there had been a time in my life when I've been accused of having four stomachs is because I ate enough food for four stomachs. But no, a cow only eats one amount of food that goes into each of the chambers of the stomachs. So that's a little bit different story. But when David says, teach me your ways, God, it's not just an academic approach to, saying, to, to studying God's word, but help me to meditate on it, to think it through. What are you saying to me? And my prayer is that when we come to God for support, is that, again, that's learning the wait. Last week I said, you know, what, when we wait, we learn to praise God. Well, when we wait, learn to wait, we also begin to understand who God is. That it, it, God is kind of forcing us to digest what we know about God from his word and think it through. Go through the four stomachs. Take your time to meditate on it, to get Everything you can get out of God's word. And you know what? After those four times, you would go back to it and still see some new things because God's word's always fresh. So David says, teach me, Lord. The third thing David said is that lead me in the straight path. And what he's basically saying, Lord, I need you to lead me. It's the straightest path. It's the most level path. Because if I was left to my own demise, I would go the wrong way. So it's not only, Lord, you teach me, but if I ask God to support me, I need to follow your directions completely. And that's the whole point, is that we need to follow the Lord. If the Lord is our light and salvation, he wants to guide us. His, light, his lamp is there, and he, he, he wants to deliver us. Well, we got to follow his plan of rescue for his deliverance. Where is that lamp lighting us to? The fourth thing is that keep me from the lies of false witnesses. Again, here the picture is that if God is our light, I'm not going to any darkness of where the false teachers are. I'm only going to stay focused on what you say. And so by way of reflection, when we say that the Lord leads us, but we do not, uh, but do we actively seek the Lord's guidance? It's one, say, one thing to say that, Lord, lead me. But do you actively seek the Lord's guidance? Do you ask God, God, I want you to lead me. I mean, I say that, the Lord is my shepherd. Boy, it's a wonderful psalm, but do we really mean it? And then a second question you need to ask yourself is, what portion of our prayers is directed towards knowing God versus asking him with our problems? I got convicted this past week in my devotions that the guy who was writing some notes in the, in the devotional guide says, you know, really, how much of your time is spent on knowing God than asking God to solve your problems? And this convicted me about my preaching. Is my preaching so much on application, the how-tos, 
and that I'm not guiding you as a congregation to know our God better. If I'm focusing so much on just the direction part, but not really talking about who God is, his, his light, and our salvation, we're in trouble because these sermons are just a spiritualized psychology or a, a therapy session. And that's not what this is. This is a time that we worship our Lord and say, Lord, this is who you are, and this is how I will respond to you. The third thing that we will find when we follow the Lord is serenity. Serenity. Uh, that means finding peace. Verses 13 and 14. Even though all the trouble is still around David, he has this confidence. He says, it goes back to this confidence. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Faith does not spare us from trials and tribulations. I mean, like David already said that, that he faced the dark times in his life and will face it to the end of his life. But David's closing words of faith are worth emulating or copying, that we should adopt it as our own. That he says that I am confident, Lord, that I will see your goodness now. Isn't it interesting? He said, I will see the goodness of the Lord, but in the land of the living. Because we often say that, oh, this life is bad and I can't wait to go to heaven. And folks, don't die too early. Folks, as long as we have breath, God says, I have to show you my grace and your goodness in this life right now. You see, God does show his goodness in what we call common grace. That he prevents total evil from happening. In his common grace, he blesses us. But there are times when he has his providential grace that he does things supernaturally, how he answers our prayers, how he heals us, even how he doesn't heal us. He answers prayers on our behalf that there's no logical way to explain what God did. So God does show his goodness. The best way, move that we can make when we are tempted to follow our own wisdom is to wait on God and trust him. And that's what verse 14 is all about. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Take heart. Wait for the Lord. God is sovereign. He is in control. God is our light and our salvation. His light will show us how we ought to live, and he reveals the best understanding of what the situation we're in. He will save. He will rescue. He will deliver us from what we're faced with by giving us the courage and hope to not sin. Hebrews 11.1 1 reminds us, faith is the confidence of things hoped for, the assurance of things not seen. We've known that verse. We've heard that before. And so my question is, are you willing to wait for the things that you're trusting God for? This is our third um, study in the Psalms. And, you know, no matter what the theme is about who God is, I've noticed that there's always a, a thread that ties all these things together. And it's always been learning to wait on God. Yes, God, you are this, you're that. But you know what? You're teaching me to wait on you, that because of who you are, I trust you for how you're leading in my life. We always say that the best things are worth waiting for. We say that to our kids when it comes to, you know, wait for Christmas, because the best thing, there, you know, those best things are coming. Uh, we say that to our kids who are struggling through their homework, you know, wade through it, work through it, you know, because the best things are worth waiting for that you'll learn from this. Well, God is saying that to us. God is saying that to us. And in the weeks to come, when we hit the month of December, 
we're going to go through our Advent series where God is telling Israel to wait upon him for what he has in store in his fulfillment of all his promises that to bring about a Savior. I love that what this verse says in verse 13, and it's a promise that we can claim. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now you could take, take this as maybe resurrected life, I'll be in the land of the living. But I have, I think this says, and like it says in verse 14, wait on the Lord, that when he says that, he's talking about God has good things. And even though around you all these bad things are happening, God is still control. Wait upon him. Wait upon him. He will show his goodness in, in this lifetime. Let me conclude with this, is that this past Wednesday, November 11th, was Veterans Day. Uh, it, was a, it is a federal holiday. But unlike Memorial Day, and I didn't realize this, is that how is Veterans Day different than Memorial Day? Well, Memorial Day remembers those who have passed away. But Veterans Day uh, recognizes those who are still alive. In fact, it used to be called Armistice Day. And you go, what is Armistice Day? Well, World War I ended unofficially when the Allies and the Germany put into effect an armistice, meaning a truce on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, which was November 11th, 1918. But actually, it did not end until they signed a treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, at, in June 28, 1919. Okay, so actually they, they celebrate when it ended. But when World War II and the Korean War happened, Congress changed it from Armistice Day to Veterans Day so that we would honor all veterans who fought in all the different wars. And because many of us are a generation, two or three removed uh, from these wars, we tend to forget the courage of these men and women that they, that they exhibited to protect our freedoms and the sovereignty of our nation. I mean, honestly, if I asked you today, what did you do on Wednesday? Did you ever stop and, and give thanks? And some of, uh, some of you uh, who have fought and, and, and served in our military, uh, you did. But by and large, and I, I have to say that even I, I did, I did very little to remember them, what they did for me. Because you forget about these things. But if you look back, You would think about the courage that these men had. And I need to ask you, as these men were willing to fight because they believe that something is true, how about you? Would courage describe your confident trust in the Lord? That he is indeed your Lord and your light. That no matter what's going around you and all the bad things that could happen, all your dark days, the trouble that you face, that you said that I still will be courageous to follow where the Lord leads me because I believe that when I follow the Lord, I will find strength. He will give me strength. And for that reason, I have nothing to fear. When I follow the Lord, I will find his support. He will help me. And all I have to do is just ask him that when I follow the Lord, I will find serenity. And I'm asking, God, will you give me the courage and hope? Or that you, Lord, when I trust in you, because of the peace that you give me, the serenity, that I will find the courage and hope. And that for that reason, I can be brave with what I'm facing. Oh, Lord, that's a prayer of our hearts, that we would live brave and courageous lives, that we could be like the psalmist David who says, that, Lord, indeed, you are our light and our salvation. You're the light that you light the path. You are our rescue. You deliver us. But it depends upon us and following your lead that you will guide us. And so, Lord, in the days to come, no matter what we are facing, give us 
brave hearts, bold hearts, trusting hearts, and the confidence in our shepherd as he guides us through. So again, Father, we thank you for who you are. And if it wasn't for the resurrection, our trust would be futile. But because of the empty tomb, we will follow you, Lord, because there's nobody else that get, has the words of life. So again, Father, we thank you for a time in your word, for we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, as we've looked at Psalm chapter 27, we've seen how David has responded to God in worship through Godward dependence and confidence through the trials that he experienced in his life. Like David, may we also respond to God with a spirit of Godward dependence as we cry out to him for his mercy and for his leading and guidance in our lives. And like David, let us also praise God for his power and, and his provision of defense over our lives. Let's sing together.
Thanks again, Eric, for leading us in response songs. And I also want to thank you for joining with us this morning to worship together. Our benediction is, comes from Psalms 23, another familiar psalm that speaks of the Lord's guidance as our shepherd. So shall we close in prayer. Lord, as we leave this place of worship and go forth into the world, may you always be our shepherd. May we follow your lead when we need to learn to be still. May we follow your lead when you correct us so that we will glorify your name. May we rest in you so that we will not fear the evil that is around us. May we delight in your blessings alone, no matter what shape or form they take. May we follow you all the days of our lives as we look forward to our final destination, heaven. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Have a wonderful day. See you next week, or see you this afternoon.